The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Again and again, regular listeners to this Equitable Society program write in and say nice things about our commercial messages. They say that our Equitable commercials are packed with helpful and useful information, presented in a sincere and reasonable way. You'll find tonight's middle commercial a perfect example of this. It deals with college education, shows why it's such a good investment for your children, then outlines a simple, painless way to pay for those four years in college. If you have ambitions for your children, you'll welcome this information from the Equitable Society coming in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file... The Black Market Hijacking. Five years ago, there was great joy throughout this nation, for peace had long left had returned. Americans who had given of their youth were getting ready to start the long voyage home, the long trek back to civilian life, back to a way of life they had fought to protect. Painters in every city were busy writing the words Welcome Home on smokestacks, storage tanks, and every other available space. From coast to coast, the face of America was being lifted. For here was a nation getting ready to enjoy an era of peace. And now, only five short years later, there are young men in this nation receiving letters which start Welcome, you have been chosen, and go on from there. Letters from the draft board. Factories, which had just about gotten themselves switched from war work to civilian production, are undergoing reconversion once more. And the morning paper is again alive with words America had almost forgotten. Words like General Pershing Tank, Bazooka Gun, and T-80 Shooting Star. There are other words, too, making their reappearance. Unpleasant words that bring back unpleasant thoughts. Rationing, price control, hoarding. A man who spent the last five years of sleep could wake and follow any conversation, could pick it up where he had dozed off. As yet, there are no black markets, but there are gray ones, because a few selfish people have caused a temporary shortage by purchasing beyond their possible needs. For that reason, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has chosen for dramatization this evening a case which took place in World War II. Maybe you will remember it. The night file opens late one night in 1943. Two men ride a small boat across the river, one at the wheel, the other appearing through the thick fog. See anything, Leo? <laughs> no, not yet. Well, we ought to be getting close. Let them move. Nah, not the way that far. Hey, Fred. Big time let's hijack a truck, huh? You think we'd score this good in the truck? No, but it'd be easier work. What's tough about this guy? I don't like this foggy air. Murder on my sinus. Leo, a five load of coffee will cure anything. What a minute, huh? Don't talk me a little. See? I should think so. Yeah. Yeah, see those lights? Uh-huh. Better get up that front line. Okay. The barge, all right. Hey, Fred. Yeah. What do we do with a barge load of coffee? What do you think we do with it? We sell it. I know that. But it's a lot to get rid of. The old people are short of coffee. It'll be a cent to get rid of. Uh, just think, kid. Helping people out when they ain't got something, we'll be helping the world. <laughs> The following morning at the FBI field office in a nearby city, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Elliot Warren. 
Welcome back to the office, Elian. Uh, thanks, Jim. Chased that young man all the way across the continent, did you? Just to buy. Well, I think you can settle down for a while. We've been put on one that has a local angle. Theft of government property. A barred throat of coffee belonging to the army was hijacked last night down the river at Auburn. Well, it shouldn't be too much trouble locating a stolen barge. Well, the barge wasn't taken. The hijackers knocked out the watchman and ferried the bags of coffee ashore in a launch. You interviewed the watchman yet? No, the Auburn police have. But he'd been assaulted by two men. He couldn't describe them, though. The fog was too thick. Well, they must have come aboard in a boat. I yeah, couldn't describe that either. But the police covered the shore this morning. They found a spot where a launch had been run in a number of times, and there were two sets of tire tracks on the beach, made by trucks. Did they lead any place from the beach? No. Hey, you uh, ready to start working on this? Well, uh, I've got just about one more hour's work on this report. Okay. I'll run down to Auburn and interview that watchman. <laughs> I'll talk to the hat check girl. Figured as long as the floor show was still on her. Just hand well it on. Sally will be free. All right. All right, folks. That's the end of the show. Now, everybody dance. Sally, know we're here? Yeah. Here she comes. Where's that show, Sally? If you get up and dance, sweetheart, it'll be on right now. Hello, boys. Hello, Sally. Hi, Sally. Get up. Makes me feel like a lady. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Business okay? Oh, I got no complaints. How about our business? Huh? Did you dig a customer? You know, a customer for the coffee. Now, let's not mention the product. I got a prospect, a real live one. Who is it? Well, now, Fred, let's get the commission angle straightened out first. I already told you. You get 10% off the top. Honey prices have jumped since then. There's a war on, you know. All right, how much now? A full chair. One third. Why don't you take it all? Oh, honey, that wouldn't be fair. Suppose we say no. My customer goes back in the day three. What's the matter with you? Don't you make enough in this joint to keep you happy? Honey, boy, I've learned to lay it away while I'm hot. Now, what do you say? Yeah, okay. You get a third. What? Who's the guy? His name is Kent. I don't know any sense named Kent. This man is a legitimate citizen. Well, what does he want with that flag? Well, you see, he likes to wave the flag during the daytime, but at night he's in business for himself. <laughs> All right, how much will he go for? Well, you can settle that with him. He's over there at the corner table. That guy in the blue suit? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Grab your drinks and come on over. Okay. Hey, hey. Pardon up. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> He smokes Phil joint green and fresh to my sign of bread. Hi, Mr. Kent. Oh, hello there. These are the boys I was telling you about. Fred Sanford, Leo Dixon, meet Mr. Kent. How do you do? Hi. Will you sit down? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sir. Now, you, you three work it out. I got to make some character with the youngsters. See you all later, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, I see you have drinks, gentlemen. Yeah. I suppose we might as well get right down to business. Okay. Miss Sally has told me about the property you have for sale. I'd like to make an offer for it. How much? I'll give you 25 cents a pound. Oh, it's worth more than that. Not to me. But a flat offer. And I'd like to add that I can't consider closing the deal until I've examined the merchandise. Well, you can see it any time you want. Where? They got a stash in a warehouse that's worth the Broadway. A fellow named Woody runs the place. Just go there and tell him I sent you. No, I don't go there tomorrow. Okay. And let's meet back here tomorrow night. We got a break on that stolen coffee. From the watchman? No, from the Auburn police. They found the launch that was used by the thieves. There's a broken bag on deck, and the stenciling on the bag matched with the coffee that was hijacked. Did you examine the launch, Jim? Yeah, and I think I came up with a lead. What's that? Well, there was an old jacket in the cabin. It was obviously worn by one of the hijackers when he carried the coffee. I went through the pockets. I found a book of matches from a local restaurant, ticket stubs from a downtown movie, and a rain check from our ballpark. That should make the thieves come from around here. Well, I'd say so. You can't have that much coffee in your living room. Hardly. Well, they're probably using a local warehouse, so let's get out the list and start checking them. Sorry to keep you waiting, boys. 
That's all right. Can't show you? Yeah, he's in my office. Come on back. You get over to see the coffee? It's nailed on the office, eh? Okay. Did you see the product? I don't know. Go ahead, boy. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Mr. Kent. Good evening, gentlemen. Sit down, fellas. Thank you. Okay. Well, Mr. Kent, did you get to see the stuff? Yes, I went over this afternoon. How'd it look to you? Fine. <laughs> All right, let's start talking dough again. I might as well tell you for openers, we're not interested in that 25 cents a pound. <laughs> to tell you the truth, gentlemen, I'm not either. <laughs> now you're talking. I have a newspaper clipping here someplace. Oh, yes, here we are. I think we should discuss it before we make any further mention of money. What is this? A story in this evening's paper. It has to do with coffee belonging to the U.S. Army that was stolen night before last. Now, uh, by a strange coincidence, gentlemen, that's what you're trying to sell to me. So? So, I can't help putting two and two together. Look, Mr. Kent, you didn't think the boys just grew that coffee, did you? I certainly didn't think it was stolen. That puts an entirely different light on the deal. You mean you're back in our... No. I'm reducing my offer to five cents a pound. Mr. Kent, you're not a businessman. You're a comedian. Look, let's break this up. We got no deal. Just a minute. I'd like to call your attention to something first. The coffee is stolen. I know that it's stolen, and I know where it's being kept. And I regret to say that if you don't accept my offer, I'll have to notify the police. It would be my duty as a citizen. <laughs> now, uh... What's your answer? I'll give you an answer. Hold it, Leo. What for? The guys, get us over a barrel. All right, so let me fix that. Sit down. Please. Nothing we can do. Let's take his offer. Are you kidding? No. When do you want to pay, Mr. Kent? Come to my office tomorrow morning. I'll give you the cash. Okay. I'm sorry to have had to use this sort of pressure. Oh, get out of here. You... Very well. Good evening, everyone. Lord, why didn't you let me cool him? Because it wouldn't have done any good. Well, you didn't do any good this way either. Don't be so sure. Come on, Leo, we get some work to do. Special Agent Warren speaking. Jim Taylor, Elliot. Oh, where are you? Down at the City Hall, Department of Buildings. What's doing down there? One of the warehouses I checked this morning was a place called Woody's on Broadway. Uh-huh. Had one very unusual feature. The inside dimensions were only half the size of the outside. Oh? Uh-huh. I checked the building plans, and they confirmed my suspicion. Well, did you see anything that looked like a breakaway wall? No, not a trace, but there's an alley running through from Broadway to the market. On one side of the warehouse is on the alley, and I think that's where the fake wall might be. Uh-huh. Elliot, secure a search warrant and meet me there as soon as you can. Elliot, shine your flash. See if there's anything here. Right. That's it, order. Hey, it feels like a catch. Yeah. Still is open, Jim. Over there. Mm-hmm. And on this bag stacked in the corner. Uh-huh. Shine your flash along here, will you? Right. That's it. Hold it. Some stenciling in one of the bags. Product of Brazil, age 38. This is the coffee, Elliot. That stencil was on the bag that we found on the boat. Good. I'll get my knife out. We'll make sure. If it's the coffee we're looking for, it should be all here, Jim. There's plenty of it. Yeah. Hey. What? Well, look, this isn't coffee, Elliot. It's gravel. What? Just plain gravel. Get behind the bag. Get your gun, man. Uh-huh. Well, huh? they'll reach your cupboard. Are you trying to steal my coffee? Are you sure it belongs to you? Well, of course it does. Well, then you're the one we're looking for. What do you mean? We're special agents of the FBI. You better come along with us. <laughs> Turn in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of the FBI. Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children. We're going to ask you to look ahead 10 or 15 years. 
to the day when that youngster of yours says... Just think, Dad. One week more and I'll be a college freshman. Oh, boy, I can't wait. Your boy or girl will have three good reasons for looking forward to college. First, because college men and women earn more money. Dad, our high school principal said that college grads earn $72,000 more during their working years than the men who went right to work after high school. Isn't that something? Second, college men land the bigger job. He said if you take 15 men who are being paid $10,000 a year or more, 15 of them, 15 out of 16, have college degrees. Third, college men get more out of life. They know what's what in art, music, and good books. Their background of culture makes them sought after by important people. So father and mother, don't leave your family's education to luck. Make it sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt, an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's already for him. Well, that's setting the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your Equitable Society representative show you how little it costs to start an Equitable Education Fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Black Market Hijacking. The man in tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, whom we have called Mr. Kent, was not alone in his greed during the days and years of the last war. There were many like him, far too many. Nor did they crop up for the first time during the 1940s. They have been with us in every period of national scarcity. Whether it was coffee and butter or whiskey and gin. For make no mistake, the black market operator in wartime is as great a criminal as any hoodlum or racketeer was during Prohibition. But because we have always had them with us does not mean we must have them in our midst again during this period. History doesn't have to repeat itself that faithfully. However, it should be remembered that neither your FBI nor any other law enforcement agency is going to keep America free of these men, for that is beyond their power. Only one group can see to it that no black market exists in this nation during the days to come. That group is composed of you, the decent people of the country. We in America are blessed with the greatest production machinery in the world, a machine which supplied the Allied armies in a global war and also maintained the civilian economy. Having shown the physical prowess that won the last war, let this time supply the moral might to put the operators of every black market where they belong, out of business. It can be done. The night file continues in the room at the local FBI field office where Special Agent Warren is questioning Mr. Kent. And you don't think it's at all strange that in addition to your coffee, we recovered loot from other robberies in the same warehouse? I told you how I happened to use that particular location to store my coffee. Mm-hmm. You picked it out of the classified directory. Well, it didn't take very long to check those things, Mr. Kent told us. Then may I leave now? Not quite, Mr. Kent. Parts of your story don't exactly jibe with the facts. For example? Well, for example, you said you went to the bank yesterday and got $2,500, which you used to pay for the coffee. That's right. Your bank statement shows no withdrawal of that amount on any day. <laughs> Banks make mistakes, you know. You also said you met this man who owned the coffee yesterday at uh, Jones' Chop House. I suppose there is no such claim. Oh, I found it all right, but I learned they were closed all day yesterday because of a death in the Jones family. Well, maybe I met him somewhere else. I'm not guilty simply because I don't remember the name of a restaurant. You also told us you had no idea that the coffee was stolen. That's true. I found this clipping in the glove compartment of your car. Tell us about the theft of coffee belonging to the United States Army. What made you so interested in that particular story? I... I never saw anything in any paper about that. You... You're making that up about my car. No, I'm not. We don't plant evidence, Mr. Kent. We find it. Now, you're an intelligent man, but you told us about a withdrawal from your bank, and it wasn't true. You said you met the owner of the coffee at Jones' Chop House, and that wasn't true. 
You said you had no idea the coffee was stolen, and we find a clipping about the theft in your car. Mr. Kent, do you really think any jury's going to believe that? How about telling us the truth? Very well. A woman I know owns the 800 Club. Sally Kimball? That's right. You know her, Ellie? We've had complaints about servicemen being robbed in her place. Never been able to prove anything, though. Uh, Go on, please, Mr. Kent. She put me in contact with the men who stole the coffee. There were two of them. After I examined it, I paid them. Then they must have substituted the gravel you found. Names of those men, please? I don't remember. Would you recognize them if you saw those pictures? (laughs) I should. Elliot, suppose you take Mr. Kent to police headquarters and let him go through that gallery. Okay, Jim. Uh, Where are you going? Over and have a talk with Sally Kimball. Just a minute. Hi, Sally. Come on in. Did you collect some cash? Yeah. Then why didn't you bring my check over to the club? Because I came right back here and went to bed. Big action last night? Oh, that's what you call emptying coffee and putting in gravel. Hmm. Took all night, huh? With a dozen guys helping. Where you got the load now? In the truck. Leo's out looking for a new stash. Yeah. It's a cut, Danny. Thanks. We hit the road tonight heading north. Maybe I can locate a customer out there. No, thanks. I'm done with them John Legit. How about a fence? It's fine when you're in. Well, have Leo contact me when he gets the trucks put away. You be the club? Yeah. I got audition. I'll be there all afternoon. Oh, Miss Kimball. Hold it, Doc. I'm trying to watch this act. I'd like to talk to you, if I may. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh. Uh-huh. What do you want? Some information. For instance. The names of those two men you introduced to William Kent. To who? William Kent. They sold him some stolen coffees, and they switched the coffee to gravel. Well, if you find him, send him to me. I can use a good magic act. Hey, Sally. Go away, Leo. Well, I just wanted to tell you. I don't need any. We're using Ford's garage. You hear me? I said blow. Okay. Now, um, now, what were we talking about? A man named William Kent. Says he knows you. Here's his picture. You recognize him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him. He got loaded in here one night last week and wouldn't pay his cab, and we threw him out. What did he do? Try to get even by telling you I stole some coffee? No, not exactly. All right, honey, let's see your next routine. Um, Miss Kimball, I I wonder if you'd mind coming up to our office. Well, I'm auditioning acts for a new show. How about later on? I'll be busy all day. Any objections? No, I guess not. Thanks. Now, prove you're a G-man. Find an exit. I gotta go back to work. Well, that trip wasn't necessary, Elliot. Well, what happened? I talked to the Kimball woman. She denies everything. Very naturally. Unfortunately, we don't have any evidence to make an arrest. Uh, Kent picked out some pictures down at the gallery. No. You make positive identification? Yeah. The names of the men are uh, Fred Sanford and Leo Dixon. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Sanford's picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one is Leo Dixon. Hey, I just saw him. Huh? Where? At the 800 Club. He came in while I was interviewing Sally Kimball. Hey. Come on, Elliot. we still got a chance to locate that coffee. <laughs> Yeah. Sally's on the phone. What does she want? She wouldn't tell me. Close the door, Liam. Okay. Hello, Sally. Fred, I can't meet you. Why not? John Law was in to see me. Huh? Any trouble? No, I brushed him. Look, I got a customer for the stuff. Who? Joe Green, 350 North Main, Centerville. He's waiting for you. Just be sure you wire my commission. Yeah, I will. Look, we better get started, Sally. See you when we hit town again. Okay. Bye. Come on, Leo. We taking off right now? Yeah. There they are, Elliot. Hold it, both of you. Huh? 
Oh, you don't. Let go. Let go. You're not taking me. Oh. Now, get up. Let's have a look at those trucks. Fred Sanford, Leo Dixon, Sally Kimball, and William Kent were tried, convicted, and sentenced to serve eight-year terms in a federal penitentiary for theft of government property. Special Agent Taylor remembered Leo Dixon telling Sally Kimball about using Floyd's garage. When inspection of the telephone directory revealed no such listing, Agents Taylor and Warren obtained a roster of owners of every garage in the city. Each owner whose first name was Floyd was checked against their files. Upon investigating Floyd Perry, they discovered he had a lengthy criminal record. For that reason, they drove immediately to his garage with the results you have just witnessed. But, as you probably well remember, the arrests in this case of a comparative handful of criminals did not wipe out the black markets in 1943. Nothing wiped them out, because too many people in this nation were steady customers of those places where, for a little extra, a rationed item was produced from under the counter. It is now too late to rectify those mistakes, but with the nation currently engaged in a battle which may yet become a full-scale defense of our way of life, let us make sure of one thing. As a people, we must resolve not to make the same mistake again. Let's show the world what we in this country already know. The average American, given the facts, will prove that among his possessions, he numbers the qualities of integrity and self-sacrifice. to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom. And thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An unusual and colorful recount of crime in the far west. Its subject, armed robbery. Its title, The Musical Stick Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Harley Bear, Anthony Barrett, Isabel Jewell, Tom Tully, and Carlton Young. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The musical stick-up on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of the Thin Man. Fun and excitement for the whole family when the Thin Man comes your way.